This is Ethan, and I'm here with Dave, and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 109-inch. On this week's episode, we interview podcast host, author, and Weird Al superfan Lex Friedman about his career, fandom, and working with Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. It's a podcast about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. You don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Hello and welcome to this week's Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al Podcast. What a fun episode last week with comedian Stephen Lynch, huh, Ethan? Oh, of course. It's always a treat when you get to interview someone you've been a fan of for over half your life. <laughs> and you are not alone, Ethan. Not only did you turn me on to Stephen's music, but we got a lot of great feedback from our listeners who were already big fans. Now, what was really cool about the interview is we got a great in-depth look at Stephen's career. And, you know, as a Stephen Lynch fan, and I've listened to a lot of his interviews, I'd never heard an interview like ours like that before. Well, Stephen did say he does not usually do podcast interviews. Well, I, I guess it does help that I'm one of the Dave and Ethans of Stephen Lynch fans. Oh, really? Which one are you? Uh, I guess I'm the Ethan, I suppose. Well, I suppose it is time for This Week in Weird Al Related News. Ah, well, now this is kind of cool and not entirely Weird Al related news, you know, aside from the fact that it's about me and I've devoted much of my life to spreading the good word of the man we call Al, but we just, you know. All right, out with it, Ethan, already. Come uh, on. All right, all right, all right. I was a guest on a podcast devoted to all things They Might Be Giants last week called This Might Be a Podcast. Now, we know Weird Al himself has said he's a They Might Be Giants fan, and, well, so am I. Traitor. Uh, for what part? Going on another podcast without you, or for liking music that isn't Weird Al? Well, now that you mention it, both of them. <laughs> well, Greg Simpson, who hosts the podcast, is also a big fan of Weird Al, so it would be fun for us to have him over on our podcast sometime. And, you know, just like you and I tend to have a bit of a backlog on interviews, well, he does as well. So, really, I've got no idea when my episode's going to air. It, it could be months. Oh, I cannot wait to begrudgingly listen to you being a traitor. Me neither. Oh, and, of course, I do talk a lot about Weird Al and our podcast, and I even talk about you, Dave. Oh, you do? Awesome. All right, I cannot wait to listen. We'll definitely spread the word when my episode airs. Well, Ethan, can you believe it? Transformers the movie is celebrating its 35th anniversary. Whoa, 35 years. Man, I can't even remember where I was 35 years ago. Well, to celebrate the 35th anniversary of Transformers the movie, there will be a special home video release on a 4K and Blu-ray combo that will include an all-new 4K transfer of the movie, as well as a blu-ray and dvd edition yes and so this will be getting both a usa and uk release and it's going to be available starting september 28th of course weird al's song dare to be stupid appears in the film and as part of the film soundtrack and there are so many versions of transformers the movie and the soundtrack out there so this one it's really for the ultra collectors like me and you or you know, if you just want it, you know, you can buy whatever you want without having a label associated with you. But yeah, I, I think this one, if you're a Weird Al collector and you're buying this, you're just so hardcore. Because Dave, I will admit, I haven't gone down the rabbit hole of Transformers the movie home video releases because I feel like there's an infinite number of them. <laughs> There's so many versions of Transformers, the movie out there. There's just so many different releases on VHS and this version and that version, then on DVD and now on Blu-ray and 4K's coming. And then not, that's not even to mention the soundtrack. I started like collecting this and it was just so overwhelming. I was like, all right, I just got to take a step back. You really have to just sit down. If you want to start collecting Transformers, the movie, you really have to sit down and just spreadsheet everything out. Once you get everything laid out, just you'll find 
dozens more things that you yeah. didn't even know existed. <laughs> it just it's like hamsters. It just keeps replicating. As soon as you look back, there's more and more. I mean, look at this thing that we're 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 talking about right now. There's the 4K and Blu-ray. There's the Blu-ray and DVD edition. Then there's also the USA and the UK releases. Then there's steelbook versions of each of those. And I can't even think about <laughs> What else we don't even know about yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one day we can set aside an entire episode and just talk about all the different versions of Transformers the movie that are out there. It'll just be a three hour long episode of us <laughs> just literally listing them off. <laughs> and the episode will never end because, as we mentioned, it replicates. <laughs> A big thank you to our friend Vincent Anderson for this pretty stinking majestic heads up. Thank you very much, Vincent. Yeah, now this is really exciting because just over the weekend, comedy musician Bo Burnham had a brand new special called Inside drop on Netflix. Our Patreon supporters Allison Parsons and Joe Jaffa gave us a heads up before Al himself officially shared a clip on his social media. But as part of that special, Bo has created a Venn diagram with Malcolm X on the left, himself in the middle, and Weird Al on the right. Yes. How awesome. I, I love I love that Bo gave Al a shout out in his brand new special. Bo is a really great comedy musician and comedian and it's just so cool seeing him sharing that love and Bo's new special was not the only exciting thing from last weekend Ethan it was also your birthday happy birthday and I hope you had a great birthday did you do anything fun well thank you Dave well I did something very fun I got a burrito 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 from burrito burrito well, if you could summarize some of your feelings about that burrito in about four run-on sentences in an announcer's voice, what would you say? Well, I would say this week's episode is brought to you in part by Vegan Burrito Restaurant, Burrito Burrito in Troy, New York, home of the two-pound double-wrapped in a quesadilla burrito burrito and Wizard Burger in Albany, New York. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito, your Burrito Burrito, or hop on over to Wizard Burger for mouth-watering, loaded, dare I say, beefy vegan burgers. From Troy to Albany to Uranus, Burrito Burrito and Wizard Burger feed the hungry with out-of-this-world, plant-based, real food, always vegan style. Visit burritosquared.com or wizardburger.com and order ahead. Very well said. Oh, it sounds like we got a call on the 347 Spatula Hotline. The 347 Spatula Hotline, the official hotline of Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast is sponsored by Angel Valenzuela and David Cash, two amazing Weird Al fans and podcast supporters. All right, Frank, let's hear this voicemail. Hi there, Dave and Ethan. Your old buddy Chris, the cartoon loving geek from Canada. And I hear tell there's a special birthday. So happy birthday, Ethan. And yes, I managed to get a very special gift just for you. And no, it's not the Charles Nelson Riley deluxe sized action figure with the Kung Fu grip like you were hoping. I swear I tried to get one, but they were all sold out. I'm terribly sorry. So instead, I decided to put my artistic skills to the test. And I managed to come up with something that I think you might like. But I want you to know it wasn't easy. I literally had to create a time machine and time travel all the way back to the 1960s just so I could get a particular television star to hold still just long enough so I could get a caricature of him. And while I was there, I managed to do another one. But that one is for Dave. And Dave, I'm sorry, but come on, you know the rules. If you want yours, you're going to have to wait for your birthday in July. I know, I know, but hey, rules are rules. And as for Frank, well, he's not getting one. And no, it's not because I don't know when his birthday is, and frankly, I could care less. But it's because of that stupid stunt he pulled last year during our Weasel Stomping Day festivities. I mean, sour cream instead of mayonnaise on the lawn? Are you kidding me? Have you no shame, Frank? So nevertheless, Ethan, happy birthday. Hope you like your gift. Dave, sorry, but you're going to have to wait. And Frank, I will say good day to you, sir. 
<laughs> wow, Chris, thank you so much for that awesome phone call, for the birthday wish, and the awesome artwork. Now, Dave, I don't know if you've seen it yet. I'll post it over in the group, but so far I've only posted it on my personal Facebook page, and it features me with none other than Gilligan from Gilligan's Island. So it's very, very cool. Chris always makes some pretty stinking majestic artwork. So thank you so much to Chris and thank you to all of our listeners and friends for the, for the birthday wishes. And Dave, don't worry. I also ate a lot of broccoli and I drank a lot of beer. In addition to that burrito, you ate a lot of broccoli and drank a lot of beer. Really? Well, I ate a lot of cake and I drank a lot of Yankaritas. Well, I guess we have another call. Frank, patch this one through. Hey, Dave and Ethan, it's your pal, Dana B. Two weeks ago, we celebrated Hanson Day in honor of Al's pals and collaborators, Isaac Taylor and Zach Hanson, as well as the two-year anniversary of this very podcast. Speaking of anniversaries, it just so happens that tomorrow, exactly two weeks after Hanson Day, Al's 11th studio album, Poodle Hat, the album that defined my adolescence, was released on May 20th, 2003. I attended my very first Al concert just two months later at the Mann Music Center in Philly on July 19, 2003. What a great show. Is there a top five countdown for this album on the horizon? If so, I'd love to be interviewed. So on that note, happy 18th Poodle hat anniversary. Sign my poodle, see who play? Dana B., thanks for that great call, and I have to agree. Poodle hat defined my adolescence, my college years... My adulthood, my elderly years. Oh, anyway, thanks a lot, Dana. <laughs> you know that concert on July 19th at the Mann Center? That was actually the first time I met Dana in person. Oh, wow. And the 18th anniversary of Poodle Hat. Wow. May 20th, though. I feel like that message probably should have been played like a week or two ago. Thanks a lot, Frank. Hey, give our intern Frank a break. Really? Nah, Frank, you suck! Well, now that we got our Frank bashing out of the way early for this week, I'd say it's time for this week's interview. Dave and I are absolutely thrilled to welcome to the podcast. He's someone who's been a super fan of Weird Al for nearly 30 years. We're so excited to have him on the podcast. He has recently interviewed Weird Al on his podcast, and he's got a lot of other really great connections we're excited to chat about. Please welcome Lex Friedman. How's it going, Lex? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Wow, Lex, this is a name that I have not heard since alt.music.weirdal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I prefer the label alt.music.weird-al, but yes, I mean, I was... <laughs> yeah, well, I remember, <laughs> like, like so many of us then, I felt so cool for basically considering myself virtual best friends with Bermuda Schwartz. Like, that's, <laughs> that to me was the hallmark of alt music weird <laughs> I remember that that somebody had shown Bermuda my Usenet signature, and he had commented that he liked it. And I was just thrilled that, first of all, that somebody knew Bermuda and that Bermuda had actually seen something that I had worked on. I had written, you know, it was a little three-line thing. I think you were limited to, like, three lines of text in <laughs> your signature. Right. But but I was so thrilled just the, that, you know, somebody in Weird Al's band actually in some, like, you know, off – you know, comment way knew who I was. It was thanks to uh, Bermuda and that news group that I first met Al. Um, when I was 15 years old, I wrote for the local newspaper. I lived in a town called Why Missing Pennsylvania, and there was the Reading Eagle Times, which still exists. And uh, they had a section that was for, by, and about teens called Voices. And when I saw that Al was going to be doing a show in Hershey, Pennsylvania, if you're a completionist, it was the May 26th, 1996 show in Hershey. Um, <laughs> I was like, I must go and I must interview Al. And so I, I wrote to Bermuda and was like, could this happen? And eventually uh, I got on the phone with um, with Al's agent and um, arranged to do an interview. And I was you know, 15 and a half years old. I brought my tape recorder with me. And when I was in the right backstage area and there all of a sudden there was Al right next to me. I, I said to him the line I had planned that I knew would slay. And I said, hi, I'm weird. Al Yankovic. He must be Lex Friedman. And he did give me a courtesy laugh. I will, I will <laughs> it was good. 
Do you still have that interview somewhere? I don't have the tape anymore because um, idiot young Lex did not keep it. Ugh. Um, but I will, I will freely admit to you my secret shame of that day, which was I had brought. And, and like I don't know if every listener here knows what a cassette recorder was, but if, it, it was one that you might have even seen. Like it was that kind of classic black rectangular recorder with a big orange record button on it, and it was you know it had the built-in speaker thing, and like that's what I brought to record the interview, so I wouldn't have to take notes the whole time. And I was terrified about it not working, but it did work. And I had a brand new <laughs> blank tape to record the thing. And they said I would have 10 minutes and they left me in there for 30 minutes. And it was just terrific. It was terrific. <laughs> and wow. it finishes. I go back into the line. Um, I listened to that tape over and over again. I still have it like fully memorized every answer he said and like, <laughs> all of that. But I, I, I go into the concert and it's my first Weird Al concert. And as I'm sitting there as a 15 year old kid who's just like over the moon having just interviewed Weird Al and seeing my first concert, I'm like, wait, I have a cassette recorder right here. I could just record this thing. <laughs> and I did. Nice. <laughs> and <laughs> then I went on. All, I didn't think at all about the fact that this was not an appropriate thing to do. And I went on all music Weird Al when I got home and I'm like, here was the set list. And here's some of the songs that he sang. And, you know, here were the lyrics. Ah. Uh, um, to the uh, concert only songs or whatever else. And um, Al was not pleased. <laughs> um, a, a message that was delivered to me via Bermuda. And now other people were extremely pleased. And I had people writing to me saying, it seems like you must have a recording of the show. Can I have it? And I was like, nope. Al's bad. Nope. And that's... that's... <laughs> I, believe, I believe that it's all behind us now, but I, I felt bad about it. I, it was just, it was so young and innocent and it wasn't like I knew any better. I was just excited. I, I yeah. didn't think like, hey, I'm getting away with something. I was like, hey, I have a recorder right here, and here it is. But <laughs> it was dumb, and I feel bad. <laughs> you didn't share the, the the recording. You just shared the you know the text a translation. Transcript. Okay, a transcript. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Including like Bermuda's intro of Al um, when it was a very long, like the Ayatollah of rock and roll, et cetera, when he did a very long, like it just transcribed every single one of them. And it was like, I think it was the first time the internet had the lyrics to G I'm a nerd, um, or I'll repair for you. Cause I just had it. I could transcribe every single one. See, what's so amazing about this story is something like that for, you know, the last tour for strings attached tour, or, or for, you know, obviously we'll talk about in a little bit of the vanity tour, that kind of thing is that happens like every single day when Al's on tour now, like at, people have Twitter, people have Instagram, people are posting YouTube videos. I guess the behavior that you got uh, chastised for, there's no stopping it now. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's just, it was not, and I totally understand why I'll be upset. And I think he had every right to be annoyed at me at the time. And to be clear, he was not a jerk. Nobody like, I didn't get yelled at, but I, I got a stern email from Bermuda that it wasn't cool. And yeah. they were right. But I think you are, if, if it happened today, um, it would be like, yes, people have their phones out the entire time and that's just an accepted part of the experience. And I, I don't think today that it detracts, it, it makes people not want to go see the shows. It gets them more excited to go see the shows. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. YouTube definitely. I, I mean, I'm, I don't know that, I don't know Al's opinion on it, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, all the views he gets on YouTube is kind of a little bit of marketing for his, his live shows as well. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I, I think that. Um, like even, you know, I, I, I work in podcasting and podcasters love podcasts because they're a great way to make sure that people go to their stand up shows, right? If it's a comedian and you have right. a podcast, that's like a built in audience to tell right. when you're going on tour. And I, I, I don't think this is too dissimilar from that now. So do you still have that tape that you recorded back in 1996 the, of the concert? I, I wish I did, but I do not have it. <laughs> I, I, I listened to it over and over. I listened to the interview. I listened to the concert. And then, like, at some point, I got overcome with guilt and destroyed it. Wow. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> the idea that Al could be mad at me. It was my first time meeting Al that day, right? But it was it was the second, like, interaction. Because I also, three years prior or two years prior, had invited him to buy Bar Mitzvah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he, sent back, uh, he sent back, you know, a signed picture. Um that said, Lex, best wishes in your bar mitzvah. Sorry, I can't be there. Weird Al Yankovic. And I just remember. It was, I was, I was just, I, to this person who I just had so much love and affection for that I had, that I had upset him. It just, I would keep me overcome with guilt. And so eventually got rid of the tape. <laughs> wow. Believe me, if I still had the tape now, I would rip it. Now I would share it with the world. But right. kids, I don't. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> 
come and get me, Al. <laughs> if you guys could just give our listeners a little summary of what alt dash music dot weird. Can you just tell us, younger listeners, you know what what that was all about and and what it was? I can take a shot at this. So, before the web was as near you know ubiquitous as it is now, news groups were. Um, you know, a different thing altogether. You didn't use a web browser to get to them. You know, you had to use what was called a news reader or a news group reader or whatever. And these were discussion boards of sorts on every conceivable topic you can imagine. And, you know, the comically, I don't know if, if Dave, if you had this experience, but like every ISP had their own connection to the, to, to Usenet. Um, right. And sometimes you would get messages out of order, never see any messages at all. But it was it was basically like what today would be a web discussion board, except it wasn't web based. It was its own thing, its own protocol. And there were news groups on every topic. And um, this is what Al is joking about when he says you've got your own news group, alt total loser. Um, Alt.music.weird-al was the Weird Al one. And it was really <laughs> just a place where you could post stuff and... Um, you know, it was threaded conversations, you know, you could, anybody could start yeah. a new thread, anybody could reply to an existing thread, but it was just a, a place to chat. And that's where a whole lot of old school Al fans met each other. Yeah. I kind of think of it as, uh, as a bulletin board, like that you would have yeah. up where each bulletin board is themed on one particular topic. So you would go to the bulletin board and you would see just like all thumbtacks of notes and stuff about <laughs> Weird Al, and you would read them, and if you wanted to reply to one, you would write out your email and kind of thumbtack it back up there, and then everybody could who walks by that bulletin board could see it, hmm. and anybody could reply to it at any time. So it's kind of like, uh, I mean... It's sort of like a precursor to Facebook, except for that you weren't necessarily you didn't necessarily have to be friends with the people that were seeing everything that you posted. Anybody in the world could see what you posted and, and reply to it at any time. That's exactly it. Sounds crazy. <laughs> it was also at the time a lot of websites were still in their infancy, and it really was the only consistent way other than something like the midnight star fanzine which was kind of on its way out as as i got into into the usenet news groups it was kind of the only way to get weird owl news hmm. and it was it was you know full of guesses what do you think is going to be on the new album you know what songs do you think you should parody it was it was all the same stuff that's on weird owl discussion boards today it was just a different right. place for them <laughs> um yeah. and i i remember so vividly the the day that Amish Paradise came out and MTV was going to be playing it every hour or something. And like I, I had my VCR and so I recorded it and then <laughs> true to form transcribed the lyrics and put them on. <laughs> all these blue down. Wanted to share with people who didn't have MTV, how great the parody was. That's uh, so great. man. I, <laughs> right. And you would, you would post things like, I know that weird Al's going to be upcoming on, Access Hollywood tonight or, or right. um, entertainment tonight or whatever the shows were at that popular back at the time. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was basically like an, <laughs> a lot like a bulletin board or even like a, an old school group email newsletter where everybody can reply all at any time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to go back, Lex, to when you're this 15-year-old child that goes see Weird Al at Hershey Park and you're meeting Weird Al for the first time other than the uh, autographed picture that he sent you. You're meeting Weird Al in person for the first time. Can you walk us through what it was like being 15 years old and meeting somebody who probably was your hero at the time? Oh, yeah. Uh, and still a, a big hero of mine. You know, so I was nervous out of my mind. Um, and the thing that I do sometimes when I'm nervous to try to help myself calm down and I did it as a kid and I do it now is especially if it's with a funny person who I respect is try to find ways to make them laugh. Hence that stupid intro where I said, hi, I'm really angry. <laughs> um, so like I sit down right away and I'm like, well, if you had 10 minutes to interview your hero, what would you ask him? <laughs> and he's like, come on, Lex, that's your job. And, <laughs> but it at least it got him a tiny bit on my side right away. But so I'm just I'm going through questions. I have a whole list of them written down. Uh, I trying so hard to avoid the questions to which he has stock answers. I'm trying to ask stuff that he doesn't always get right. asked. Um, and then sometimes asking the stuff that he always gets asked and has stock answers for. Uh, but it's really just going and it's fine. And then maybe about 10 minutes in, I had said something about ask something about like, 
other artists he liked or other songs that he liked. And he went with an answer that I'm guessing you've seen before where he talks about the the real song, Mama Get the Hammer, There's a Fly on Baby's Head. But before he could get to saying that song as one of his favorite non-Muriel songs, um, Ruben came in and said, may I have the phone, please? And I was like, sure, take the phone. And I... I repeated, is that your answer? May I have the phone, please? And he found that, for whatever reason, funny. That tickled <laughs> Alex Fancy in the moment. It was just like me being, not a, a punky, jerky kid, but just trying to make him laugh. Like, clearly what I was going for it. Like, oh, is that, is that your favorite song? May I have the phone, please? And uh, since I had that tape, I've heard Ruben ask that question many, many times. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, that was like, but so really it was just talking and me being constantly terrified that at some point, the handler, whoever it was, was going to come in and say, okay, your time's up. And there was one other person there to interview, uh, like a regular grown-up person. In my mind, like a thousand <laughs> years old because I was 15. Um, and I was like, man, I got to do better than that guy. I got to be. I got to show Al that I'm more knowledgeable. Like I just I wanna... And that guy was perfectly kind. We didn't know who was going to get pulled in first, but they picked the kid to go in first. But it was really just, you know, just sitting with him. And we were like knee to knee sitting kind of at a, almost like at a vanity counter. It was not a a fancy green room that he had or a dressing room or whatever. It was just a room. Um, but it was just so cool. And then, <laughs> honestly, then going, when it's all finished, he shakes my hand again and thanks me and he was very nice, posed for a quick photo. Uh, and then, like on a disposable camera because that's what I had. And um, <laughs> then getting in line, back in line because it was, uh, I think it was like a, an open seating outdoor Hershey Park venue. Um it's it's such an immediate like crash, right? Because now I've, I just met Weird Al. I just spent a half an hour with Weird Al. Now I'm in line with all these people who think that they're Weird Al fans, but I literally just spent a half an hour. Like literally, literally just, you don't know Al. <laughs> like, um, I met Carlotta Barnes that day, which is a, another name from the alt music Weird Al era. Sure, uh, absolutely. Um, I met UH Jeff that day. Um, <laughs> And it was just, it was cool to meet all these people, put faces to names from the that news group. But it was uh, the come down from, like, and I hadn't told anybody else I was doing the interview. So then as I was meeting these people, I was like, guess what I just did? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was a really good day. That's so amazing. And the article that you wrote was well-received? Yeah, it was the, the back page of that issue. I, I have a hard copy of it somewhere, but it doesn't seem to exist online anywhere. But I did okay with that interview. I definitely like was cribbing from styles that I liked of other people who did interviews of, of musicians. And I was like, I caught up with Al at his Hershey, Pennsylvania style. Caught up with him, <laughs> which is just the dumbest phrase, but you see that a lot in like certain kinds of interviews. I don't know. I loved it. It was, it was the coolest. And then a couple years later, so that would have been 15 then. So uh, I guess three to four years later, I had met a friend almost certainly through that same news group. Uh, but now I'm in college. And it's the summer after my freshman year of college. And Al is doing three stops in Boston. And I was going to school in Boston and staying there for the summer. And this person I had met who was going to be coming to the same college I went to, Brandeis University, um, wrote to me and was like, I happen to have backstage tickets to all three of these shows. Do you want to be my plus one? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, huh? I'm not on the list. I'm literally the plus one. It's, yeah. it's her backstage tickets. And we go backstage after the show. And Al looks at me for a second and he goes, Lex Friedman, Hershey, Pennsylvania? <laughs> wow. It was, like, it was three three years. It was either three or four years later, but he knew exactly who I was. Wow. Just remembering it. And our friendship has only grown. And then did he yell at you for... Yeah. He's like, do you still have that tape? Give me that tape. And that's when he destroyed it. He took out a hammer. <laughs> I've been trying to track you down for three years. <laughs> it appeared by that time that he had forgiven me. Okay. He did not bring up the tape. <laughs> now, after doing that article for the newspaper and doing that interview with Al, did you go on to interview other folks for the newspaper? Or was that just kind of a one-time thing? That was a one-time thing. You know, years later, you mentioned that Al was on my mostly defunct podcast, Unprofessional, during this quarantine time. But years later, when I first started that podcast, Unprofessional, um, you know, I through dumb luck and tenacity started to get other heroes of mine to come on that show to, to be interviewed. I, I did a conversation first with, um, I think Jonathan Colton, which led to John Flansburg of the NAB giants. I spoke to some actors I really like, like Josh Molina, but I didn't do others for that newspaper. That was really just a one-off thing of like, my hero is coming and I could do this. Let's see if we can make it happen. <laughs> That's so amazing. And, uh, I, I guess, you know, jumping ahead to unprofessional and your, your interview with Al, uh, you mentioned Jonathan Colton and John Flansburg, two heroes of mine as well. 
Uh, but I also noticed that you had Mike Kaplan on, someone who uh, has been on our podcast. I saw that you've had Mike on, on this podcast. Mike and I went to college together. Oh, no way. Uh, he went to Brandeis, too. Wow. Um, and he and I were both... Well, actually, he might have been a linguistics minor, but I was a linguistics major. We took many classes together. We exchanged emails as recently as today, as we're recording this. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the email exchanges between me and Mike are exactly what you would expect, just full of insanity, <laughs> jokes, and puns. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So I've spent lots of time with Mike, and I, I know he's just the quickest and smartest and, and craziest linguistics person ever. <laughs> and honestly, I, I I mean it sincerely. I taught him literally everything he knows. So ah, that's... okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> now, I, I do want to talk more about your amazing interview with Al from last year, but um, I wanted to go back to something you said. You you know, you know you, you told the story about transcribing the Amish Paradise lyrics, but then you actually, a few years after that, you actually did a parody of Amish Paradise. <laughs> so I, I, I did meet Al at various uh, events and backstage things, and, and it was always great. And I remember, I don't, I don't know when Prosthetic Lips came out. Do you know when that came out? The Weird Al tribute album? That yeah, it came out in 1996. So, okay, so it was around the time that I interviewed him because I recall, I think it was at that first time meeting, I was like, I gave him a tape <laughs> of the three <laughs> songs I had submitted for that oh, wow. Weird Al fan tribute album, which I think <laughs> was organized through the uh, the news group. And so I remember, and it's on the tape, which is why I can remember it so well. But I remember telling him, it has three, here's three songs that I made for this tribute album. One of them is called Weird Al Paradise, a parody of Amish Paradise. One is Weird Al Yankovic, a parody of Colin and Sick. And the other one is, I don't remember what the third one was. Hang on. I'm trying to get my brain to catch up. Um, I don't know what the third one was. But he's like, I'm detecting a theme here, Lex, because like all three were just like named Weird Al. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I did record Weird Al Paradise, uh, which I still remember many of the lyrics from for that Weird Al tribute. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. Uh, how did you get involved with Prosthetic Lips? Uh, as I recall, it was just somebody said, let's let's put this together. Um, let's make this happen on that news group. And then I was like, I, I have to be on this. If there's going to be an album that fans make about Al, I've got to find a way to do it. And I, I bought a karaoke track. Or no, actually, it was the original instrumental track of Coolio's Gangsta's Paradise. And <laughs> the recording setup at the time, I have much nicer recording setup now, but the recording setup at the time was like, uh, a boombox, you know, that had tape to tape for dubbing, and I literally played it on one side while I recorded from the microphone on the other side. It was as low tech as you can imagine. That's incredible. <laughs> Watch Gump and Yoda and Jurassic Park. I'm a groovy guy, so I put on sunglasses in the dark. I yell at that guy to stop dragging my car. You can read all about it in the Midnight Star, etc., etc., etc. It's full of great lines and Weird Al references. It's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. And did you submit all three songs to Prosthetic Lips? I think I probably did, and I don't know how they chose or who was in charge. I don't remember much. It's funny, as I was thinking about doing this conversation with you guys today, uh, I was thinking about all the old, kind of old Al stuff, and I couldn't remember the specifics of how that album all came together exactly. But I did remember a guy that maybe, Dave, you'll remember this name. Um, Sudden Death was what he went by online, who was like the original like website of uh, compiling old random weird owl rarities you know like that's where you could initially find school cafeteria and belvedere cruising do you remember this site or that guy sudden death yeah actually we've actually had sudden death on the podcast he's oh, uh wow. he also he's now known as devo spice or tom rockwell oh wow yeah he's a very prominent uh, comedy musician he's been played on the dr demento show many times uh, but yeah, I do remember that website. I do remember. I think it was it probably not out there anymore, but it was something like suddendeath.org. Yeah. Right. It was definitely <laughs> something like that. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. You kind of had a website for a while, too. It was all about Weird Al, uh, Weird Al running for president. I think this was what back in 2000 or so for the 2000 election. Am uh, I right on that date? It, it might have been the 96 election, actually. Oh, okay. But it was, uh, <laughs> um, whenever, whenever Al Gore was running, I don't, man, I don't know. It was a long time ago. But yeah, I had a site called Al for Prez, which was done as a parody of Alta Vista, <laughs> which is a site that used to exist, kids. Um, it got me in, uh, I forget what the magazine was called, but it, it was written up in a couple different magazines. Um, internet, it was some angry name of the magazine, like Internet 
anarchist, which was not the name of the magazine, but it was written up in a couple different magazines and um, it had a big old, not affiliated with Weird Al <laughs> um, <laughs> note on it. And it was, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it definitely got all kinds of pickup and sometimes it would show up on like random local news segments and people <laughs> got that it was a joke, but it was a slower time back then. Right. <laughs> and then somebody <laughs> else started making bumper stickers um, that said, don't blame me, I voted for Weird Al. And I remember the tagline on my website was vote early, vote often, vote Al. And that's, that was the best I could come up with. Lex, Lex, that's somebody else who made those bumper stickers. You're talking to him right now. That, that was, was you. <laughs> so we have definitely exchanged emails because I remember I emailed you at the time like, oh, we should have put a link to the Al for press. <laughs> That's incredible. I think I still have a few extras if you if you still need another copy of that. Of course I do. <laughs> wow. Obviously, your, your campaign to get Weird Al uh, elected to president was not successful because, as you uh, as we know, Weird Al was not president and has not been president since. But do yes. you know how many votes Weird Al got? through your campaign i do not do you have that stat are you about to present me with a number (laughs) uh no um i did try to search um back for (laughs) essex county where i live in new jersey to see if uh how many votes were because i'm pretty sure i probably would have voted for weird (laughs) i mean (laughs) so uh i had to search to see how many votes were were cast for weird al yankovic but unfortunately it did not give a breakdown by write-in votes. So I, oh, I was hoping bad. you would be able to help me out a little bit. I'm so sorry. I cannot. So at least one vote. Let's say at least one vote. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, like, so you're, you, you see Weird Al for the first time. You get to interview him. I'm sure then you saw him again, you know, when you're in college. You know, you've seen him every tour. Is that safe to say? Yes. I, I think I've, my, my, I've. Incre- each new tour I go to more and more dates from so I think I actually don't have count any longer but I know I stopped counting when I was in the the somewhere between 35 and 40 yeah <laughs> that's great <laughs> another thing that's really exciting is Al did this great vanity tour where he played all these originals and you know these cover songs and I understand you had something to do with that I, I had a connection to that tour so this to me, an exciting part of my life was, you know, I, I had all those experiences with Al growing up in different times. Um, skip ahead many years later, it was now 2003. I was getting married. It was August 2003, and I saw that Al was going to be doing a. Con- I lived in L.A. at the time, and Al was going to be doing a show in L.A. like two or three days after my wedding. I was like, well, I'm going to have to miss that one, and so I, you know, emailed Bermuda, which was always my thing before a concert. I would email Bermuda and be like, hey, I'll be at the show, and good job. And that time, I was like, hey, I won't be able to go to the show. Uh, because I'm getting married. Uh, And he wrote back like, we were talking on the bus about how little Lex Freeman's all grown up and married now. And then on my (laughs) wedding night, my wife surprised me with tickets to that show. So we did go to that show a few days later, and uh, that was exciting. Later I took my kids to see Weird Al and emailed Bermuda again. And he thinks, holy crap, Lex Freeman has kids now. Um, (laughs) But when I saw the story come out, when it was first announced that Al was going to do the ridiculously self-indulgent, ill-advised vanity tour, the thing that killed me the most was it's a new set list every night. Yeah. And, yeah, well, yeah. you know, so before this time, I'm going to jump back and forwards in time. I'm like an episode of Lost. But before <laughs> that happened, you know, I had developed a career in podcasting. And, um, I, you know, I at the time I was at a company that was the company that made um, like Comedy Bang Bang. And so every once in a while, although I lived in the East Coast now, I'd be back in the office in L.A., and Al would be in there to record a guest spot on a, the podcast Comedy Bang Bang or to record a guest spot on another podcast. And every once in a while, I would see him and say hello, and I didn't always know if he knew that I was the same person, although I assumed that he did because he had already demonstrated to me his impressive memory. <laughs> and uh, one time when I was going there, like uh, I was going to be making a trip to L.A., I emailed Al, and I was like, hey, I will be in L.A., I'd really love to talk to you about a podcast project. Um, Would you be able to come in? And he was like, of course. (laughs) And so Al came in for a meeting that I cut. I like, I summoned Al and like (laughs) in in this world, I was the the studio exec. (laughs) And we sat down and we had a great meeting at the Earwolf studios. And we talked about different potential podcast projects, none of which came to fruition, but it was like, I had a business meeting with weird Al. How great could that be? So So now fast forward, (laughs) they announce this ridiculously self-indulgent ill-advised vanity tour. And I email Al, within 24 hours and i'm like 
this is amazing. This is a tour that people are going to want to hear every night of. You're doing different songs every night. You're doing these cover songs. Like, I work for this big old podcasting company. I don't work for that company. I work for another podcasting company. But, you know, we have this service called Stitcher Premium. I would love to come up with a way that we could record every one of these shows and put them all up on Stitcher Premium. And Al was like, I'm going to connect you with Jay, his agent, um, his manager, I should say. And, um, you know, talk to him and see if you can work it out. And I had uh, some email conversations with Jay and some phone conversations with Jay. And he's like, Al wants everything to sound perfect. And, you know, it's a live show. Sometimes you're going to hit a wrong note or the acoustics aren't going to be perfect or a mic doesn't pick up the right thing. Like, he wants it to sound perfect. And there's no way to ensure that 77 shows will sound perfect. They can't go and, and tweak whatever mistakes get made across 77 recordings of, you know, a dozen or 18 songs every many <laughs> show, songs were played in the show right <laughs> and he's like so it's uh, we really appreciate this um this all makes sense but we can't do it and this was after you know probably several weeks of back and forth phone calls and, and emails with me and jay yeah and i sit down and i'm dejected and i write one more email and i wish i had it, it was a work email i don't have access to that account i wish i had the email but i wrote probably 12 paragraphs um and I was basically what it came down to is this: like, listen, I've been a fan of Al's since whenever. Uh, I invited him to my bar mitzvah. I interviewed him at this thing. I met him again years <laughs> later. Like my whole life, I've taken my kids to see Al. I went there three days after my wedding. Like, and I'm not alone. I've seen every Weird Al show I can, and I'm you know well enough to do that. I, but even you know, like I, I've I'll, I'll, I've bought tickets to see some of these shows already. As soon as the tickets went for sale, I bought them. But I want to see all of them. I want to see even more than I can go to. And there's some fans who can't afford tickets. There's some fans where he's not going to their city. And I'm just a regular Weird Al super fan. And I can say a regular Weird Al super fan because I think there's a lot of Weird Al super fans. <laughs> and we don't care if, uh, you know, a drum hit comes in late. Sorry, Bermuda. Or if, you know, somebody plays the wrong <laughs> note. Or if, uh, if something goes wrong, we just want to hear these things. And, like, I don't think you have to worry about is every note pitch perfect. I think what you have to worry about is my fans would love access to this and it was incredible fan service to make this happen. And uh, I sent it and an hour later Al wrote back, let's do it. Wow. <laughs> and wow. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> That's I incredible. couldn't believe it. So the the worst part of the whole thing was I had bought tickets to all those shows and then they told me I could go to whatever shows I wanted for free. So <laughs> I the money. I'm glad for Al to have it. It's fine. Um, and he was compensated handsomely for this too, by the way. But so the, the, uh, it was awesome. And early on we were getting recordings and, you know, from the first couple of shows, cause I was definitely nervous about like, I want to make sure this is recorded well and that this goes right and, uh, whatever else. And, you know, um, our team was, um, you know, had a triage, the mixing and mastering of these things. And then Al wanted to hear the mixing and mastering. And early on, he's like, oh my God, you guys are turning around, these around so fast and I'm hearing stuff that I want the band to do better. So thank you. Like we, he was literally <laughs> listening to the recording of last night's show and being like, the harmonies need to be different here. And Steve's coming wow. in too late on this part. Like he was, it was like, <laughs> I, I feel bad for the band because we definitely made their lives harder. <laughs> um, but like each recording would come in and go into a Dropbox folder. And I was like, oh my God, I can hear this before anybody. And I just, I <laughs> loved it so much. Each one was great. And then the true nightmare of it all was he did a different, like Al owns part of his catalog and like wherever Scotty Brothers has ended up owns part of the catalog and Sony Music owns part of the catalog. So we had to get rights for sharing all those songs. But then there was a different cover song every night and we had to get, we had the list, so I knew I knew ahead of time. And you know when you know a thing, but you can't share yes. it, and like you know that people would love to know it. So like oh, yeah. I had a list of every cover song he was going to do, and I was like, oh my god, he's going to do eight six seven five three zero nine at a show I'm at, and I love that song. My cover <laughs> band does that song, like, but I couldn't tell anybody, and didn't. Uh, but I had to get publishing rights for all of those songs. That's wow. just a legal annoying thing, but like you have to have rights. Wow. I was wondering and about so that. We had a bunch of lawyer stuff going on with that. And a lot of people were super chill about it. We were like, we cannot pay you insane amounts. Like this is a premium podcast that people have to pay to get access to. Like it's not going to be massively listened to. Yeah. So one of the songs he was going to cover was take the money and run slash taking it to the streets, two different songs by Steve Miller. So I have to write to Steve Miller's manager who also happens to be Steve Miller's wife. And I'm like, Al's doing this tour. We're doing this thing. Can we get the rights? Blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I'd like to hear it. So I get the recording from the team and send it. <laughs> and in the song, you can find this on YouTube now if you don't have Stitcher Premium. Uh, but when Al covers it, he 
he sings one of the lyrics of the song, which isn't a super strong rhyme. I don't know how well you know the Take the Money and Run, but it's, uh, I know in that song he rhymes Texas and where the facts is or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Al stops the song um, to be like, hold on a second. This does not rhyme. Um, <laughs> this is not, oh, the, the rhyme that he cites is, Old El Paso and Great Big Hassle. That's the, the first rhyme. And, and Al's like, this does not rhyme. Um, and the, he does later rhyme down in Texas with what the facts is. Um, but Al stops it, makes a joke, and he's like, we can't, uh, this is you know an insult to the English language or whatever. Let's go to taking it to the streets instead. <laughs> and so the, the wife responds, and she's like, Steve's not going to be okay with this. He's making fun of his song. I cannot give you permission. <laughs> and at this point, like I've gotten 90% of these things permission. And this is like a holdout. Right. And I write back and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, it is all in good fun. Like Al only is covering songs from artists he loves. And she's like, I mentioned it to Steve. He listened to it. He thought it was the funniest thing of all time, so I was totally wrong. You can <laughs> use it. We need no money. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't even think Al knows that story, by the way. Wow. But, but, uh, <laughs> God, it, working on that project was a dream. In some ways, it was also a nightmare. There were issues all the time, like certain venues all of a sudden when we got there were like, oh, you have to pay us like $5,000 if you want to use any recordings right. that come out of this venue. Right. And we had to negotiate with them and it sucked. But like, it was so much fun. I was so grateful that he did it. I did get to go backstage. I finally got to meet Jay in person at a couple of those shows. I got to take a couple of friends to those shows. Um, I, I ran into um, UH Jeff at one of those shows, I think in Atlantic City. Wow. Um, <laughs> and it was just, it was so awesome. And I, I feel like UH Jeff maybe even got a shout out during that show. From he the did. Yeah. I was jealous of. <laughs> he did, yeah. Um, I was there too. <laughs> I'm sorry we didn't say hi. But yeah. um, man, that it was, it was truly a joy. And I was sorry we couldn't do it on the, um, you know, the strings attached one. But there it wasn't a different set list every night. Right, so it's a little right. bit tricky to record <laughs> right. the same show every night, but I'm so glad we did that. I was so glad he did that. And I, I cannot tell you, I, I I've written a bunch of things. There's nothing I'm prouder of than that email, which turned it from like, it was a solid. No, it was a pass. And it turned it into a yes. You're welcome. Al fans. <laughs> we thank you on behalf of all of weird Al's fans for sending that last final email because the Stitcher uh, premium recordings of every Weird Al concert off of the Vanity Tour are some of the greatest Weird Al recordings. Even just to hear some songs that have never been played live before and yes. also to hear them, them in intimate venues. And, of course, all the cover songs, which we would never expect Al to do a straight cover of a song. And here he did 77 <laughs> of them. Well, a different one every night. And yeah. he had the banter between the songs, telling stories that you know you would have missed if you weren't at all those shows and there's some really great gems yes. and, and i i just i can't get over how <laughs> how how incredible it is that you know back in 96 you got in trouble for transcribing lyrics <laughs> and then you know fast forward 20 years and you are facilitating getting 77 entire weird Al concerts. I never made this exact connection. But yeah, it is. It is yeah, it did. Uh, it, uh, I feel like if nothing else, that earned me, um, you know, forgiveness. Absolutely. <laughs> but so you guys, you stitch your premium to this day. You still, you, you are familiar with these. You've heard them. You've heard the shows. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It was, awesome. it, it was awesome. I mean, and it was a surprise to us. I mean, it wasn't announced until... I think, you know, Dave and I, we, we went to that first show and there was a big sign, listen to all the shows on Stitcher, you know, yes. eventually. And, yes, that uh, was right. that was a contractual thing we had to negotiate on because like Al was concerned that if we, or maybe Jay was concerned, somebody was concerned that if we announced it too soon that people wouldn't go to the show. And I was certainly making the argument like, I don't think that's the case. Right. <laughs> I think people will still <laughs> right. go, but like we need to make sure that Al's fans are aware of it. And so there was... Actually, you can still probably look this up, but so there was a contractually obligated number of tweets that Al had to send or Instagram posts that Al had to post about the tour. And we had to have those cards at the tour. And you can still today find the tweets where he's like, I would be saying this even if I wasn't contractually obligated to tweet, <laughs> which he was contractually obligated to tweet it. Because the whole thing was making sure that people knew right. about the show. Like, that's the only way we can make any money back on it. Was right. If people subscribe to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And Lex, you were spot on where uh, in your email where you said you didn't think that 
uh, Weird Al fans would necessarily care that they weren't carbon copies of basically what was on the album. It, right. it, going to the concert is, you know, an experience. That, there's reasons why, you know, I've gone to nearly 200 concerts, why, you know, Ethan and I went to, you know, 18 concerts each on the last tour because we love the live experience. And not that we're looking forward to we're not that we're looking to see, you know, oh, Al missed a note here or, you know, John forgot to, you know, bang his drum here or whatever. We're not looking <laughs> right. for that kind of stuff. But it does add to the live concert experience when that kind of stuff happens. So to, to have that included on all the Stitcher recordings really, you know, made it um, made it sound like you were live and you were there in the audience for each and every concert. I just remembered something that maybe now you can tell from talking to me, but I only thought about it as we're talking here. Every single one of those says, like, this concert was recorded Thursday, May 10th, 2018 <laughs> at the theater at the Ace Hotel in Los Angeles, California. Those were all me. You know, <laughs> as as we were talking and I heard your voice, I was thinking that. So thank you for confirming that. <laughs> and, well, what was so funny is in some of these cases, we didn't know how to pronounce the city's names or we didn't know how to pronounce the venue names. And so I'm literally in the studio with the, the Stitcher team. Like there's the, I don't know how to say it now, but the Friday, May 4th, 2018 show was in Ivins or Ivins, Utah at the <laughs> Tuacon Amphitheater at the Tuacon Center for the Arts. And I remember we would literally Google these places and call them so that we could hear how they answered the phone. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and, <laughs> so then I would just repeat, like, what's the, what's the town you're in? And they'd be like, Ivan's or whatever. It's like, oh, okay, cool, thanks, bye. <laughs> and then we could record it. <laughs> oh, wow, that's amazing. Was there ever any talks of putting out CDs or a, a thumb drive of, of those shows, an official release, aside from the Stitcher Premium? No, I know that, um, as I'm sure you know, that Al eventually put together a video kind of compilation of all of the covers, or some of all the covers, or maybe it's all of those covers. Right. I don't know. I'll, I'll, he put out something on YouTube, yeah. and it used our audio um, that we had captured. Uh, but I never, there were never any conversations about us doing anything other than we'll put it behind a paywall. Um, I absolutely think that they should release it in more ways and let, let people have it because, you know, they are great shows. I, I truly love them. I'm so glad that those exist. And I mean, they're, they're, they're very re-listenable. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Especially on a car trip or something, you know, because when you listen to music, sometimes you put it on shuffle and this is like an instant shuffle because all the shows are different and they're different orders. Yes. And what I'm remembering now is the reason I knew about the notes that Al was sending to other to, to to the band members is because he would do it on our chains, right? So he would like um, reply to us saying like, "Hey, here's notes on this. Like, you should be boosting the you know Ruben synthesizer at this point of airline Amy." Um, but then he would add like Ruben and be like, "By the way, you're getting to this thing too soon." And it was just so <laughs> funny because it was like the vocalists, <laughs> the backup singers. It was like, and he would always have people and i'm sure like listen they clearly all love him right they've worked with him for a thousand years but he was just to see how meticulous he was and how much he wants to do right like i love that about him. oh yeah well so so we know you you knew you know at least a roster of which songs were going to be played you knew what the covers were going to be did you know the set list orders not until the shows um but we knew all the songs that would be played so like i had the list of i don't remember how many different uh I, like obviously there's lots of overlap between the different set lists even though the set lists were different every night right um so i don't know if it was 50 songs or 40 songs where it was but i knew what all 40 songs were because we knew which ones we had to go get publishing rights for on that side too so we, we knew that very early on and then before the tour started we did get the set list per show but like i didn't have that months in advance but i had that at the start of the tour okay well still that's in you know, knowing ahead of time it's pretty amazing there was one song that was rumored to have been um, ready to go for the tour and, and was cut and uh, that rumor was trigger happy do you have any information on that i don't have any information on that boy it would be cool if i could confirm or deny that one way or the other but i i don't have access to those documents anymore right <laughs> i would be shocked because i i love that song and i don't understand i don't know how you could pull it off without using tons of backing tracks <laughs> um uh, but yeah i don't remember that one and i i know for a fact because of how meticulous it was that we did not get permission for any songs that we didn't use so by the time we were getting publishing rights, that was not on the list because there was nothing like, hey, how can we have to get this one if it's not in any of the shows? Because we had to know how many times each song was in a, you know, how many different recordings the song was in. Oh, wow. Okay. 
what was plan B if, let's say, Steve Miller decided, oh, there's absolutely no way I'm going to approve this? What was plan B for the cover songs? It was very similar to my plan for when Al said no. <laughs> it was big. <laughs> like, I did not. It would be so weird to, like, just not include the cover song. And Al didn't want that, and we didn't want that. Right. Um, so it was it was it was to beg and there were you know there were a couple others nothing that was the story as fun as steve miller but there were a couple of others where we had to go back and forth a few times but eventually everybody got it and honestly it's one of those things where once you can say by the way these folks said yes or these 20 artists said yes they're like look we're covering all right. these giant names it made it easier right right there was definitely confusion people being like is he parodying it <laughs> no <laughs> no i said he's just covering it it is a straight cover of the song <laughs> Now, were you familiar with the spreadsheet that one fan had created to track the tour and all the songs? <laughs> yes. Yes. I was in that spreadsheet at some point, and we would use it to help, like, confirm that everything we had was the same. <laughs> and, like, people were counting how many times things came up. And I was like, man, I have all this. I have this in another spread. I have this in another Google spreadsheet. Like, I have all this. But it was a nice way that we literally used to cross-reference. That's sure amazing. Right. <laughs> I loved wow. I loved that. And I'm so glad that um, – I, I, I don't have his name in front of me, but I'm so glad that he did that. And, of course, he crowdsourced it for the shows that he wasn't at. And that was just so amazing. And I think Al even referenced it uh, at at least one of the shows. <laughs> yeah, no, it was <laughs> it, it, well, the funny thing about that was I remember it like had the visualization that showed you like certain songs that were only performed like one or two times. Right. On that tour. Right. Which was cool. <laughs> right. Now, were, were those percentages, did they have anything to do with the rights that you had to guarantee like uh you know you, we could only guarantee you know this is a bad example but we could only guarantee um you know six plays of nature trail to hell or anything like that or was that purely just artistic decision from no Al? that was that was really i think entirely al's choice i found the spreadsheet i have it open right now <laughs> <laughs> yours or the the fan made one the fan made one yeah <laughs> <laughs> the the song performed the fewest number of times besides the fake Albuquerque version and the audience inspiration song performed seven times was That Boy Could Dance. That seems like the right number of times to perform that song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I think maybe he would have uh, performed a little bit more if we if he had had with him on tour our past guest, Jimmy Z Zavala. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Could have played the harmonica. I'll share one other, just not a, a unique to me Weird Al experience, but an, an experience that I just absolutely loved. The first time I took, maybe, no, it was, it was, this was the first time I took my whole family to see it. So I have three kids. And we all went to see Al at um, Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Yes. Um, and sure. we're there watching it. And as anybody who was there knows, or even people who are there knows, Lin-Manuel Miranda comes out during Yoda to sing a line of the chorus. And this is like peak Hamilton time. Yes. And right. <laughs> I will freely admit that there are Friedman children who might have been even more excited by Lynn than they were about Al. Oh, they were plenty excited about Al. <laughs> but like, I took a photo. Many people take photos. There's a lot of tweets going about it. And I tweeted, you know, with, and this is before I had done a deal with Al because I would have gotten better seats otherwise. <laughs> but this is before I had done that deal. <laughs> and I, I tweeted out like, this is so weird. I just went to see Hamilton and Al came out as Thomas Jefferson. And Al liked that tweet. <laughs> I was very proud. Well, just since you you're, you're mentioning that moment, uh, I've never talked about this in the podcast, but leading up to that show, Bermuda kept saying to to me whenever I'd see him at shows, like, "Oh, there, you know, there's a big surprise on this tour, or there's a big surprise at Radio City." And um, when it got to be Yoda, the last song of the concert, I was like there's got to be a surprise during Yoda. And I just filmed that song from my seat. And <laughs> so I was actually the first person to post a video of nice. Lynn popping out. And I got retweeted by Lynn, you know, uh, Rolling Stone nice. <laughs> used my tweet. Al liked the tweet <laughs> and retweeted it. It was pretty incredible. <laughs> I have this, this long standing dream of wanting Al to follow me on Twitter for no particular reason. It hasn't happened yet, but one day. Yep. One day. Maybe Al will follow you after this interview. <laughs> and um, I, I would even say probably one of my most popular tweets of mine of all time, not necessarily the most, but one of my most popular ones that led to a video of mine being watched in like 50,000 times on Twitter was also a parody. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, 
Um, <laughs> I, I didn't realize until my kids pointed out that I have a long-standing habit, years long, of writing theme of writing lyrics to instrumental TV show theme songs. <laughs> it is a thing that I always do. Um, and yeah. my oldest daughter and I watched all of the West Wing together. And years ago when that show was originally on, I wrote lyrics to the West Wing theme song. Like, this is the West Wing. We think it is the best wing. It's not the North Wing or the South Wing. Anyway, uh, on the, when we were watching the series finale, I recorded us singing the song because each episode we would sing my stupid lyrics to the theme song. And the West Wing Weekly uh, podcast Twitter account retweeted it. So Bradley Whitford saw it. So he retweeted it. Lin Manuel Miranda liked it, and like, that thing blew up. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. <laughs> it's not directly Al related, but I'm sure he is the reason that I like to write. Of fun course, too. of Who's course. Himself? So we talked a little bit about your uh, podcast interview with Al, and I, I, you've got so many podcasts that I just want to kind of go through <laughs> them, and maybe you can just give us a, a, a little tidbit about each of them. So this podcast, Unprofessional, where you had Al on, the whole idea and correct me if i'm wrong is that you're talking to people about everything but their career yes that's exactly it and it, it came up kind of accidentally where at the time i was working as a full-time writer for a publication called Macworld, and when we first started the podcast we recorded a couple episodes we were talking to tech people about tech stuff and my editor was like you can't do a tech podcast because we might do tech podcasts and then yours would be competitive so we went back and did new episodes with those people, but didn't talk about tech, and that became the gist of the show. So we ended up getting, you know, a surprising number of famous people on that show. I remember Dave Coulier did a funny episode. Josh Molina from The West Wing, um, his episode was all about geocaching. Uh, his, <laughs> oh, wow. doing, doing geocaches with his son. But, um, you know, there were two dream guests, uh, and Al was definitely the bigger dream than the other. And we talked about Al as my dream guest all the time. And during the pandemic, um, you know, the show had been defunct for years at that point but my co-host and i were like wouldn't it be funny if we just put out one extra episode and this was the weird al yankovic episode <laughs> and i just went for broke and emailed him and he's like yeah i can do that <laughs> i'm literally <laughs> doing nothing else but being stuck inside my house uh, and he was great we did it on zoom he had um his his virtual background on zoom was the between two ferns set so it was, it was just a delight <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's and it, it, you know anyone who hasn't listened to it, it is fantastic. It really is a, a a great interview because, you know, like you mentioned earlier, when you see Al interviewed, he gets asked the same five questions by everyone, and you get the canned responses. And this was really an opportunity to just hear about Al and his family and and what he likes and you know how they do dinner. You know, just really yes. intimate, really interesting things that. Uh, I'd never heard Al talk about before. There are times I can listen to myself and be okay with it. I've recorded my voice a whole lot over my career. <laughs> it happens when you work in podcasting. <laughs> I can't listen to it. I have listened. It's still in my <laughs> podcast app, and I've listened probably like 15 minutes because I get I I can just hear the fawning fandomness in my voice. That's not really weird, but I can hear my 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 fanning out, and it kills me. And I'm like, oh, you could have said that so much better, or let the man talk. Right. Right? I, just, I, I have heard right. I have heard like not even a third of that episode so wow. far. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're listening to it for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't want to spoil it for you, but at the end of the uh, podcast, Al kind of talked a little bit about work. He talked a little bit about the what was going to be the 2021 tour, and he did uh, drop a little um, hint as to one of the venues that he was going to potentially be playing at if the yes. 2021 tour had happened. Uh, do you remember what that venue was? Was it Carnegie Hall? Yeah. Yeah, Carnegie Hall. How cool. Oh, man. That would have been amazing. Be show. And I'm sure it'll happen. It'll happen. <laughs> now, being such a super fan of Al, you know, having, you know, talked to him when you were 15 and, and done all of this amazing stuff with him, were you dying to just ask him some, some nerdy questions? <laughs> There is a question I have wondered for so long, which is so stupid, but it's in uh, Polka Your Eyes Out. Why does he say, check out the hook while the DJ revolves it, when the lyric is, check out the beat while the DJ revolves it? <laughs> and I have wondered that for years. And years. <laughs> well, now I'm going to wonder that. <laughs> <laughs> I might have gotten it backwards. He says beat and the original lyric is hook and I don't understand why he does that. And I've wondered for a long, right. long time and I did not ask that question, but I did wonder about it even then. 
I, I, you know, I just knew that there was something that you would have had that you wanted to ask. <laughs> I just knew it. As you were interviewing Weird Al, or as you were talking to Weird Al uh, recently back in uh, May of 2020 for your most recent interview with him, were you uh, tempted to ask him any questions you had asked him way back in 1996 as a 15-year-old boy? <laughs> <laughs> just to see if his answers were the same or not? It was almost exactly the opposite. I was so focused on don't do any of those because even the questions <laughs> I thought were good, I had asked. It was like, I and it's especially because it's not meant to be, you know, an interview about him, about or I should say about his career. It's not meant right. to be about the music right. and about the career and all that. And so it's like, just be professional and just be chill. And you know, <laughs> my co-host on that show, Dave, is always like laser focused on. It's not about the guest. It's about all three of us. And that's very hard when it's somebody as well known and beloved yeah. as Al, because um, of course it's about Al. And I don't think if you, I mean, I haven't listened to it all, but I don't think if you listen to an episode that it's in any way about us more than it is about him. But I was definitely trying to like treat it like it's an episode of the show. Like it is an episode of the show. Like just, <laughs> just talk, just talk and be chill. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I talked. I don't know if I was chill. <laughs> but like the fact that I can say I did a business deal with Al, like Al came in and met with me in my office, like like that's right. me it's so cool if i could go back and tell my younger self that those things were gonna happen like it's it's mind-blowing to me i've met so many of my heroes now and <laughs> they say don't and i think they're wrong because i have not been disappointed by my heroes. <laughs> now in the in the episode i don't know if you remember this since you haven't listened to it i, I don't know if al actually agrees to it but you, you you guys sort of propose like hey if on may 12th 2021 if we're still stuck in this pandemic let's all get back together and do another episode. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm the one who made that comment, I'm complimenting my own joke, so that's classy. But uh, <laughs> uh, I highly doubt that he remembers making that promise, and I don't know that I would hold him to okay. it. It seems, it seems almost cruel. I'm not saying I wouldn't, but I'm not saying I definitely would. Okay. <laughs> well, keep us, keep us up to date if that... Uh, it happens <laughs> now I, I mentioned you you had all these other podcasts so you're not doing unprofessional anymore uh you had one called your daily lex uh sounds like you just kind of for a, a time gave daily five minute or less updates yes that was and every once in a while i mean it, it went like a couple years i guess it's the same thing i do with impression i went a couple of years of the gap and then another few weeks of episodes but uh, it is it was basically my recording of my shower thoughts okay <laughs> think about it in the shower and then record it right afterwards uh you had a podcast about fatherhood turning this car around turning this car around uh with two other dads and over time you know we our kids really grew up during that show and it was fascinating but i i, I loved doing that show and every once in a while we'll, we'll put together an episode but that one is is no longer active right and uh as far but as now the, you're up to the active ones. now we're up to the active ones this one sounds like something I need to listen to immediately. It's called Friendly Competition. I think that if there's any of my podcasts that fans of, of this podcast would like, that's the one. Friendly Competition, I think, is the best podcast distillation of my brain that exists. <laughs> I don't know if either of you is familiar with the um, the British TV panel show Taskmaster. No. Um, if you're not familiar, I strongly recommend you no, check I'm it not out. It's, it's on YouTube. They make all the episodes available for free. Um it is five comedians per season, and they are competing in very stupid tasks, and they are judged. Uh, they compete separately. They do them all at separate times. Okay. So it might be like, when you go into the next room, there will be a watermelon. Eat as much watermelon as you can in 60 seconds. <laughs> and when they go into the room, some of them, before they go into the room, they they try to find a fork. And others just go into the room, and there is just a whole solid watermelon. So some of them are like smashing on the floor and scoop as much as you can. And others are like, let me gingerly cut with a fork and knife. But like, it is so funny. And then the taskmaster arbitrarily scores as he says. <laughs> oh, it's it sounds incredible. <laughs> so anyway, my podcast friendly competition is not that. It is it's not even a rip off of that. It's at, at best uh, an homage okay. to Taskmaster, but it's uh, it's giving people ridiculous things to compete over in real time in podcast form. So there's usually four contestants, um, a scorekeeper, and and me. And you know it might be uh, you know name. Uh, you know, pick any three words from the Beatles song, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Uh, 
and you only get points for the ones that you are the only person to submit back to me. <laughs> so <laughs> like, what, you, what words are we going to pick from I want to hold your in hand? Um, or give me, you know, three words that, or give me three famous marks and there's a, a bonus uh, secret point or a secret penalty like if you submit Marky Mark you lose 10 points so it's, it's just a dumb silly my rules only game show oh I love it oh, that sounds great <laughs> it's incredible and uh, not to dismiss the other ones but um, they also seem great uh, not playing which you watch movies and comment on them yeah, not playing was a podcast because I had developed a reputation in certain circles as not having seen movies that everybody else had seen. Okay. So initially it was an idea for <laughs> I, my buddy Dan and I. Dan and I co-host many podcasts together. Yeah. But my buddy Dan and I would watch, uh, show each other movies that everybody else in the world had seen but that Warner both of us had missed. So that's where I saw The Karate Kid and Die Hard. And I actually, in the first season, I showed Dan UHF, which he had never seen. Wow, okay. Um, oh, cool. A recent season, I finally saw all of Star Wars, most of which I had not seen. And truly, um, when we watch uh, The Phantom Menace, that's the plot that I understand the best, thanks to Al. <laughs> and I, I reference that during right. the show. Like, I know what happens in this one. Um, but yeah, so that's not not playing is a lot of fun. The most recent season was during the pandemic. Uh, I made Dan watch a bunch of football movies. Okay. <laughs> He's, he might start speaking to me again at some point. <laughs> Uh, so the other active podcast you have is called The Rebound. That's for a different kind of nerd. You know, we're <laughs> Weird Al nerds here, but that's for <laughs> Apple nerds especially. That's just a podcast about technology. It's very cool. With a couple friends. It's very cool. I mean, game shows, technology, movies. I mean, that that's all stuff I, I feel like Weird Al <laughs> nerds can appreciate. <laughs> there's there's a strong Venn diagram situation happening here. <laughs> <laughs> Before we let you go, I did want to also hear about these books you wrote. Uh, it sounds like they maybe were inspired by, you know, your love of parody through Weird Al. That's a, a great pull uh, to think of it that way. Um, one of them is, is you know, just for grownups, and that's called The Snuggie Sutra. That's a parody of a book <laughs> called The Kama Sutra that's about Snuggies. It started out as a blog. Uh, and, you know, it was just, you know, one of my friends had the idea of what if... What if this thing existed? And so we just we had a friend who was an artist, and she would draw these fo- pictures for us. <laughs> and the pictures, of course, were totally safe for work because everything's covered by the snuggie. <laughs> um, and we would love. It was at a time when there were a lot of book deals coming out of blogs. Okay. And so we were like, maybe we could get a book deal. And we just knew no one and had no way to do it. And we gave up, but we just kept publishing to the blog. And then one year, uh, the snuggie folks put out a um, – th- they did something during New York Fashion Week. And whoever wrote it up knew about our site. And so as they wrote it up in, I think, the, the New Yorker, um, they mentioned, you know, here was this thing. And uh, it's, you know, now they were literally unveiling sexy Snuggies that had like leopard print patterns, <laughs> zebra print patterns. And they're like, this would tie in well with the Snuggie Sutra. And that got, that day when that printed, um, we got, we started drowning in offers from from book publishers wow. and book agents. And so wow. that Wow, wow. And then I worked with my same agent uh, to do, after um, Go the Blank to Sleep came out, um, my editor was like, how did you not write a popular children's book parody? And I'm like, I don't know. It wasn't my idea. It was there. And they did a great job. <laughs> Go the F to Sleep is a really funny book. And she's like, you have to do this too. And I love rhyming. I love Dr. Seuss. And so I wrote a parody of The Cat in the Hat that was called The Kid in the Crib for you know parents of young children. And I will freely admit that Kid and Crib are not perfect rhymes. But many, many people parody Dr. Seuss and don't honor his meter or his rhyme structure. And I'm proud to say I believe that The Kid in the Crib really, really does. Um, initially, Random House was going to publish it. And then the Seuss Estate, which is published by Random House, said no. Wow. <laughs> so okay. that it was published by somebody else instead. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was. Fun. I loved writing that book. That's it was awesome. really fun. <laughs> Did Steve Miller appreciate the kid in the crib rhyme? <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping he does. <laughs> Lex, thank you so much for joining us. This has just been really amazing going down memory lane, hearing about your Weird Al fandom and, and your amazing projects. We can follow you at Lex 
free lex fri on twitter and al if you're listening feel free to follow lex and we can also <laughs> head over to lex <laughs> al we know you're listening don't try to hide it we know <laughs> and you can also head over to lexfriedman.com to get all the information about your current podcasts and past podcasts and all of your other projects Lex, this has just been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Well, Dave and Ethan, thank you so much. And I, as you probably already know, just so you know, if you do try to Google my name, oftentimes you're going to end up with uh, Google saying, did you mean Lex Fridman? And I'm not that guy. And that guy is very annoying because he also podcasts and people get confused. Yeah, it's Lex Friedman with an IE that we're looking for. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's such a pleasure to talk to you both. And this, this podcast is a true achievement. So congrats to you both. This is just fantastic. How great. Thank you so much for joining us, Lex. And a big thank you also to UH Jeff, who told us that Lex would be a great guest for our podcast. Well, UH Jeff sure was right. That's a great aspect about our podcast is getting to hear the stories of these incredible Weird Al fans and, in Lex's case, how he took his fandom to the next level and collaborated with Al on getting all those Vanity Tour recordings up on Stitcher. Hey Dave, did you know that our podcast is also on Stitcher? Yeah, I did, but did you know that you do not have to get Stitcher Premium to listen to us? But if you had Stitcher Premium, it wouldn't stop you from being able to listen to us. Well, yeah, but instead of buying Stitcher Premium and then using it to only listen to us, you could, you know, just support us directly on Patreon. And or by purchasing some of our official merchandise at shop.2000inch.com. Well, Ethan, what is your favorite thing to wear? Uh, let's not go there, Dave. No, no, no. I mean, on your head. I said, let's not go there, Dave. Well, Ethan, you know how you are always wearing caps. Well, yeah, they're not only a great fashion statement, they keep my head warm and the sun out of my eyes and they protect me from hail storms and deflect the ravenous claws of the rabid wolverine in my underwear when I listen to Yoko Ono's Greatest Hits Volume 6 on vinyl. And Well, Ethan, I think I have found the perfect cap for you. Oh, really? Well, because I actually have been looking for a new black or navy or olive or gray or green tiger camo colored camper style cap. Well, our friend David Grant sells camper style caps on his website, wolfinwool.com. So, Ethan, you are in luck. Well, Dave, you know I'm pretty picky with what I allow to adorn my head. You know, so it also needs to be 100% cotton, soft structured, five panel, low profile, and have metal eyelets, and it absolutely must have a nylon strap clip closure. Well, you are in luck. Over at wolfandwool.com, you can pick up your very own 100% cotton, soft structured, five panel, low profile camper style cap with metal eyelets and a nylon strap clip closure in black or navy or olive or gray or green tiger camo. Whoa! What are the chances? Unfortunately, I don't think that one's going to work. You know, I'm sure it's a good cap and all, but... I do just have one more requirement. It's the most important one, Dave. Oh, really? Well, I'm not even going to bother telling you. It's just so specific. Well, give it a try. Now I'm just curious. All right, well, the cap would need to say wolf in wool on the front. I know, it's ridiculous. We'll never find one. Well, this is really your lucky day because that camper style cap does say wolf in wool on the front. Oh, uh, no way! Oh, I need one in black and navy and olive and gray and green tiger camo colored. Hey, wait a minute. I thought you didn't wear camouflage clothing. Oh, I, I, I don't. And why would that be? Well, it's because I want people to see me. Oh, well, that makes sense. Well, you can pick up your very own camper style cap, shirts, gear, and other great merchandise, including all of David Grant's music, books, and more over at wolfandwool.com. Dave, you know where I definitely want the top of my head to be seen? Where would that be? Darwin, Minnesota. This week's episode is brought to you in part by Discover Darwin, promoting tourism in Darwin, Minnesota. Not only is historic Darwin, Minnesota uh, beautiful, it's also banking. Welcome back to our series of Discover Darwin ads about banking. 
Oh boy, I knew that one could not be enough. Right you are, Dave. There's just so much to cover. Really? Isn't there just one bank? Perennial bank? Well, as many of our listeners may already know due to their own independent research after last week's ad, Perennial Bank was previously known as Farmer State Bank and has been serving the community for more than 100 years. Yep, obviously. And Farmer State Bank was one of the few banks that did not close during the Depression. Yeah, I mean, you know how depressing that would be if they closed during the Depression? And not only to this day do they continue to succeed and grow, they maintain their positive earnings and strong capital position while reaffirming a five-star rating for safety and soundness with Bauer Financial. Wow, five stars? That's impressive, if it's out of five stars. But if we're talking the American flag, five stars is pretty bad. So visit Darwin, Minnesota on your next expedition. Discover Darwin, more than just the twine ball. And after you visit Darwin, Minnesota, be sure to visit discoverdarwin.biz. Each week, we're able to bring you our podcast absolutely free thanks to our sponsors, Burrito Burrito, Angel Valenzuela, and his son, David Cash, Discover Darwin, Jackson Scoggins, and David Grant. And thanks to our amazing close personal friend Patreon supporters, Kenneth, Jared, Jake, Javier, UH Jeff, Zeb, Allison Blair, and our newest close personal friend Patreon supporter, Frank from the Bank, and everyone else in our pretty stinking majestic Patreon family. If you enjoy our family-friendly weekly Weird Al podcast, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash 2000 inch or picking up some pretty stinking majestic official Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast merchandise, such as t-shirts, tote bags, pillows, tank tops, mugs, towels, hoodies, fanny packs, socks, leggings, face masks, and more over at shop.2000inch.com. And remember, right now, Patreon supporters have access to check out the Black and White and Weird All Over bonus episodes, 1 centimeter and bonus episode 2 centimeter, the first two episodes in our special book series, where we sit down with author John Bermuda Schwartz and go page by page, picture by picture, centimeter by centimeter, through his book, Black and White and Weird All Over. Patreon supporters get to hear all the bonus episodes early. Everyone else, stay tuned. Episodes are coming soon, or you can just join our Patreon family and listen now. We love hearing from our listeners and other Weird Al fans. Join our Facebook community and post about Weird Al by visiting group.2000inch.com. And we also love it when we receive voicemail via our official 27-hour-a-day podcast hotline, 347 Spatula. You might even hear your message on the show. For everything about our podcast, including incredible past episodes and guests, be sure to visit weirdalpodcast.com or 2000inch.com and keep up on new episodes, podcast news, and events by following at 2000inch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And thank you for subscribing and leaving reviews, hopefully 5 out of 5, not 5 out of 50 American Flag Stars, on Apple Podcasts, Podcast Attic, Spotify, Stitcher, or the podcast app of your choice. Thank you once again to our guest Lex Friedman, as well as Vincent Anderson, Allison Parsons, Joe Jaffa, UH Jeff, Chris Sear, and Dana B. Thank you to the Grammy Award winning Jim Kimo West for our incredible theme song. And thank you to Weird Al Yankovic, as this podcast probably would not exist without him. And a big thank you to all of you, our listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters, and sponsors, and everyone else who makes our podcast. Possible. Thank you for listening to Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast, and always remember to gill and chill. All right, Ethan, I was thinking if we were to make a Venn diagram like Bo Burnham, but with our names on either side, what would be in the middle? Hmm. Well, Dave, what do we have in common? Well, I suppose we both like Coke Zero. Well, duh. Well, is there anything else? We both have cell phones? Come on, let's get real. That was Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al Podcast, episode 109 Inch. White and nerdy to the core. There's, there's a strong Venn diagram situation happening here, yes. <laughs> <laughs>